you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Job chapter 1. We'll be starting with verse 1. Job chapter 1, start with verse 1, going down to verse 3. In the land of Oz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 of the yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. And he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. God, as we just come into this time, as we come into this service, we pray that you please bless the sermon time. Please bless and give me the words of wisdom to explain it accurately. And God, please give us open hearts, open minds, open ears, open uh, uh, minds to just follow your word and to take it into our lives. We just pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. When we come to the book of Job, there's lots of questions that we wrestle with. And here's one that I want us to really wrestle with. How do you stand during the impossible? How do you stand during the impossible? When you look at Job's account here, and you see everything that Job had to deal with, all the tragedy and all the heartache and all the problems he dealt with, he was able to stand under the most extreme circumstances. What this passage, what this book actually teaches us is that the righteous will face events that we cannot, we cannot change, we cannot control. You know, too often, we live in a society where we're able to control everything. You ever notice that? You're able to control what you watch, when you watch it, and how you want to watch it. You're able to do that with music, you're able to do that with food, we're able to do everything. And so as a society, we start thinking that we should be able to handle and control any situation. And then when something comes up that is beyond our control, when something comes up that we cannot change, we struggle. It's impossible for us to control everything in life. So what do we do? When we cannot control the events that are going on around us. Job's life shows us how we can deal with events in our life that we simply cannot change. And the first thing we cannot change is the actions of others. I want you to look at verses 4 through 5. This is still setting up the entire book. But I think it does tell us something important here. Look at verse 4. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes. And they would invite their sisters <coughs> to eat and drink with them. When a period of fasting had run its course, Job would sin and have them purified. Early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their heart. This was Job's regular custom. As we start off here, we note that Job is a righteous and upright person. We really don't know much about his children. We really don't know what they're having in their events. But his conclusion here is he is afraid that they may be sinning when they get together. He's afraid that in their time of partying and in their time of drinking, that they have done something, perhaps even cursed God in their hearts. I want us to understand this. Job could not control the behavior of his children. I don't mean this in, in the stance of they were out of control or, or they were wild people. It doesn't say that. Here's what it is. As a righteous man, Job's deepest fear was that they sinned. As adult children who had free will in homes of their own, he could not control their every behavior. He couldn't watch everything that they did. So what could he do? Well, first of all, I want us to understand that it bothers us when people do wickedness. As a Christian, it should, in your heart, whether you're the one committing it or not, when you see 
sin, when you see wickedness, when you see people's moral failures, it should bother you. It should worry you in your heart about their sin. It causes us pain at times. It does bother us. But I want you to understand, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Just as God gave you free will, he's given everybody else free will. They will make their own choices. You cannot control them, but there is something you can do. You see, Job showed us something he could do for his children's sake. Number one, we can pray for them. When Job knew about their gatherings and he was fearful about their sin, he went and did the priestly thing. It, it seems that either Job was a priest or as the head of the household in this time period that he was able to offer sacrifices. What Job did is try to do what he could for them. He would offer sacrifices for them. He would pray for them. Job did what he could on behalf of them, even though he couldn't change their behavior. When we look at the end of the book of 1 John, 1 John is written to Christians. John tells us what we can do for other people as well. 1 John chapter 5, starting with verse 16. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray, and God will give him life. A rebirth of those who sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying he prays, he should pray about that. All sin, is, all wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. Here's John's point in this passage, in case you wonder what was. He starts off at the very beginning, when you know somebody is in sin, pray for them. You can't control them, but you can go on behalf of them to God, to lift them up in prayer. You can pray for them to have strength to resist. You can pray that God would work in their life and help them to remove this sin. You can pray that God would lead them into the paths of righteousness. Prayer is something anybody can do at any time. You are not helpless to watch somebody. You just need to give them the help God commands you, and that is to pray. And there's a second thing you can do. We can be an example to for them in order to win them over. You know, it's sometimes interesting to watch what Satan tries to do to distract us. He gets us caught up with passages and, and makes us forget what we're supposed to be learning. And this happens with 1 Peter chapter 3, start 1 through 2. Whenever we look at the husband and wife roles in the scripture, we always just start focusing on those instead of what Peter is telling us here through the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says here, because we get caught up with the husband and wife relationship, but actually pay close attention to what his point is here. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husband, so if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. I want you to forgive for a second that we're focusing in on the submissive or the head of the household part. Notice what he says instead. There is salvation at stake here. It was not uncommon for people in the scriptures to sometimes be married to a spouse that was not a believer. And Peter's saying, if you find yourself in that situation, you be an example to the point they will follow you. When you're looking at somebody who is not a believer, you pray for them, but you also be an example. Job was an example for his children in righteousness. Had they been able to live longer in their lives, they probably could have followed his example and not gone into some of this behavior he was worried about. You need to worry about your life. When Jesus talked about the fact that uh, take the plank out of your eye before you take the little sawdust out of somebody else's eye, here was his point. It wasn't, hey, mind your own business. It was, hey, you take care of your life, because when you take care of your life, when you get into a good spiritual situation, when you get into a good spiritual place, you're able to help somebody else. Here's the point. When you guys are looking for somebody stuck in sin, you show them the path of righteousness by your behavior. Have them want to follow you by your example. It's something we can all do. When we are focused on what we cannot change in others, we'll not be able to help them. 
When somebody is caught in serious sin, when somebody is caught in serious wickedness, we feel helpless because we're looking at, hey, I can't make decisions for them, which you can't. Hey, I can't make them quit this sin, because you can't. And then we start feeling helpless like there is nothing that we can do, except that's not what the scripture says. There are plenty of things to do. We just get caught and focused on the things we cannot do. The way to solve a problem is not to look at all the things that won't fix it. The way to fix a problem is to look at how it can be fixed. You're not helpless. You just can't force the change in people. The heart of Job, though, is about this spiritual war that's going on. Something Job didn't even know was happening. And as we look at the book of Job, we have an advantage that Job doesn't have. We get to see what actually was going on between Satan and God. And we see this in Job chapter 1, starting with verse 6. One day when the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them, the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your hands, but the man himself did not play a finger. He says, Christians, we know there is a war going on. I, I don't know how much information Job actually had at this point in time, but it doesn't seem like he was all familiar with everything that was going on. Whether he even knew that there was a Satan or not, whether he knew that there was a devil or not, I don't know. We know this. We know that we have an enemy. Satan <coughs> wants to harm us. This is a reality we don't want to talk about. We don't want to think about Satan. We don't want to think about the devil. We don't want to think about the dangers of this world. We would rather pretend that they do not happen. But there is. 1 Peter chapter 5 Verses 8 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers through the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. You ever been in the zoo and heard the lion roar? Something else, when you hear a lion roar, have you ever noticed the reaction of the other animals? When, when that lion roars, fear comes upon people. Fear comes upon the other animals because they know what kind of animal it is. They know the danger he, pre he presents. And that's the exact way that the Bible describes Satan. He is a roaring lion looking to devour. Today, Satan wants to harm you to the point he pulls you away from God. We cannot change the fact this war is happening in this world. The book of Revelation gives a very stern warning that Satan described as that, that dragon is out for war and he will not stop until this, this world's over with, when he is finally cast into hell for all of eternity. This is an unchangeable fact of life. 
Which is why Peter tells us two things. Be self-controlled and alert. You see, we have to ask the question, if we can't change this, what can we do? The first thing is we must be aware that it is happening. When you are unaware of life's dangers, when you're unaware of the facts of harm, you will walk straight into them. But when you know that they exist, and you know to be on guard for them, you will watch out for them. It's like somebody wanting to break into your house. They don't tell you in advance. Because if they tell you in advance, you'll be sitting there with a gun and a phone in your hand. When we're prepared, we can handle it. So therefore, we must prepare for battle. Being aware is not the only thing. You must be prepared. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us how to be prepared. And I want to tell you, there are too many Christians today who are not ready. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the spirit of the word, which is the word of the, the spirit of the uh, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions and all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, Always keep on praying for all the saints. I want you to go home today. I want you to think about something. I, I, I seriously do. I want you to look at your house. I want you to look for all the things that you're actually preparing for. Do, do you have, you know, something there at the house to protect you against somebody who might break in and, and harm the family? Are you prepared? Are you prepared by having maybe some extra food or something put up in case of an emergency? And, and you know, hey, if a tornado comes by or if we have a power outage, I know that my family's going to be safe because I've got this means of preparing food and, and water. In, in case of a financial meltdown, have you got a, a backup plan? You see, we plan for everything. We, we look at ways to protect our families by looking at these things, right? Are you prepared for Satan today? If Satan were to meet you, would you be prepared? As we look at this armor of God, what happens to the soldier back in the Roman Empire that didn't have the breastplate? It didn't have the shield. They weren't prepared for the arrow that came to their heart. <coughs> what about the soldier that left his sword at home when the enemy came? What good did that sword do him at home? The armor of God is not just some little kids thing we make up to, to teach kids a nice little story. It's good to, the issue here is you are not waiting for war. Satan is bringing the war. And if you're not prepared to fight him in your spiritual life, you can't help your family. You can't help your friends. It's not coming. It's here. 
Do you take the same spiritual inventory in your life right now? With your prayer life, with your scripture life, with your church fellowship life. Can you stand? You may just be following. You see these chords here? Every month, somebody's telling me, I think you're going to fall over here. In fact, I, I, just show of hands, how many of you guys are waiting for me to actually trip up here over these chords? You're at least honest. I like that. Because others have warned me. You're waiting for it, so that's why we can do it. You say what? Why are you telling me I think you're going to fall? Is it because you want to laugh when I do? Or is it because you're really worried something's going to happen? I'm here to tell you there's something more dangerous than these courts. Don't worry about me tripping. I'll fall over air. I don't need these courts to fall. My wife is laughing at me. It's true. I need you not to fall safe. Are you prepared? For we must help others to stand. You don't have strength enough alone to stand by yourself. You will fall. You know, we watch movies like Rambo. You know, you ever watch Rambo and how in the world did we ever lose a war with him in there because he seems to be able to take down a, a whole army? You're not Rambo. He's not real. If you try to stand alone in this fight, you will fall. You may not be able to stop an attack, but you can be ready to handle the attack. The truth of the spiritual war <clears throat> You can't shield your family from if Satan will attack. You can only help train them to stand when it happens. But you can't do that if you don't make yourself ready to stand. Simply put, we just can't stop the tragedies of life. Start with verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The ox, oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby. The spans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped the toad. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped the toad. While he was still speaking, another messenger said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped the toad. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. I am the only one who's escaped to tell you. You ever thought you had a bad day? I want you to imagine Joe was dead, right? You lose your children and your fortune and your servants. You are left broke, penniless, and the only family you got left is a wife who is going through pain herself, which is going to be seen in the second chapter. How do you handle I want you to know, because sin exists in this world, death, disease, and danger also exist. 
It's not what God intended. It's not what God wanted to have in this world. But it's what came because of sin and our disobedience. No matter what we do, these three things will exist until the world comes to an end. Death, disease, and danger. And the righteous will meet their fair share of problems in this world. Do not think because you say, I'm going to church. I'm going to not have any problems. Don't think that just because you say, I'm getting baptized today doesn't mean all your problems are going to disappear. Don't think that everything in life will just be perfect. The servants of God will have the same problems in this world that even sometimes the wicked do. I want you to look at Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Start with verse 1. It was at this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him and putting him in prison, and handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after Passover. The three closest disciples in Jesus' ministry were called the inner circle of James, John, and Peter. You just saw James got killed. Peter would have time in prison and eventually would be killed by being crucified upside down. John was an elderly man who became exiled because of his faith. Don't think Christian will escape problems in this world. Somebody once asked, well, what good is it if Christians will face problems? What good is it than to be a Christian? Because you have the hope that gets you through the problems of this world. It's that hope of the resurrection. It's that hope of eternity in heaven. It's that hope that we have that the world does not have that gets us through every disease, every death, every danger we face in this world. We can't stop them, but we can't deal with them. So what do we do? Number one, understand the reasons why tragedy happens. Job didn't have this information. This is one of the things that make Job's book so interesting, is Job at this time did not have the information of why all this was happening. He struggled with it. And God finally came to his rescue. And here's the thing. We have the entire scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We know why sin is in this world. We know why death is in this world. We know why there's danger in this world. We know why there's death in this world. Understand the fact that this stuff is happening because sin exists in this world. Number two, put your focus in the right direction. You cannot always stop the bad things and you can't live in the past where the bad things happen. You can find healing. You can find peace. You can, you can find hope. And you can focus on heaven. When this world fails, and it will, we know that our eyes are on heaven. We're to build the NCAA tournament. It's a very interesting tournament so far, is it not? You ever notice, how, how do you advance? A team that focuses on the negativity of their losses of their past season will fail again in the tournament. They have, there, there's something that sometimes if you ever listen to the announcers talk about, when you make a mistake, it's about forgetting that mistake in the moment and moving forward, right? Christians, you cannot stay and handle the problems of this world if you're focusing on this world, you have to put the focus on heaven. You see, the world we live in is broken. Sin broke it. Mankind broke it through sin. But the heaven we go to is not. There's peace in this world. Knowing 
not every problem we face today will be one we will face for all of eternity. Then in the chapter, Job reacts very interestingly, and I want to look at that for a second. Because I think Job gives us a map of how to handle our problems in this world. So let's look at Job chapter 20, start with verse 22. At this, Job got up, tore his rope, and shaved his head. He fell, faith, he fell to the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. The first thing that Job did was grief. Job grief. You have to understand a little bit of that culture and a little bit of the scripture background to understand what he did. When, when he shaved his head, when he tore his robe, that is a sign of that day and age of great mourning, of great distress, of great grief. Job took time to grieve. And I think that's something that as Christians we don't feel like we, we do enough. In fact, if somebody's grieving, sometimes we tell them, don't cry. But sometimes you need to let the person get the emotion out. It's hard to deal with at times. But I want you to understand, this is such an important part of life that Jesus himself did. I want you to look at John 11, start with verse 33. John chapter 11, start with verse 33. This is often one of the... You know, whenever you have people say they, that you're going to quote the scriptures, the easiest scripture in the Bible to remember is Jesus wept. We just don't often see why he wept. When Jesus saw her weeping, this was Mary, by the way, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, the people who came to comfort her, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked, come and see him. Lord, they replied, Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. It's so okay to grieve in this world, the righteous even Jesus did. The second thing that Job did was so important was he went to God. I think a lot of us misunderstand his little statement here at the end where he says, the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He's really not necessarily blaming God for his problems. He's wrestling with his problems. Throughout the book, Job doesn't understand why these problems are going. The common theology of that day was, if you did bad, God's going to punish you. Job is wrestling in his heart in this book about how he doesn't understand the wickedness he did and how God is punishing him, and he struggles with it the entire book. But the one thing he doesn't do is blame God to the point that he leaves God. When tragedy hits, people have one of two reactions. They either run to God or run away from God. The problems in this world, grief, will either bring you closer to God or take you away from God. When Job is saying, uh, talking about these problems, he doesn't understand why it happens. He is simply saying his trust. If God gave these things, if God allowed these things to be taken away, there's got to be some answer that only God has. <coughs> So what do we need to learn from this? Number one, the righteous will have natural reactions to tragedy. The difference being is that the righteous will do it in a healthy way. When you're dealing with grief, when you're dealing with tragedy, when you're dealing with problems in this world, you can deal with it healthy or unhealthy. The Christian learns the tools. The righteous learns the tools to handle their problems in a righteous and healthy way. A way that will help you find healing and a way that will help you turn the, the corner. Learn <coughs> the biblical methods 
of handling tragedy. Number two, our reaction to God will come from the maturity we develop or the lack thereof. We did a sermon on this probably about a year or so ago. And it is up on YouTube and stuff right now, but it comes out of John 11 about the reaction of Martha. I want you to look again at John chapter 11, verse 17 through 27. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, You have been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. That's a very strong statement Martha says in her Greek. Where does she get this from? She got this somehow from the teachings of Christ. When problems hit in this world, you have to dig deep into the well to find the maturity to overcome. Martha found this because she had developed it over the years. You will not have the tools to handle life if you don't develop the Christian maturity to draw it. In order to run to God, you need to have built up the stock inside of you to be able to go to God. While you're helping, develop the maturity that leads back to God. We talked a lot today about the problems you have in this world. Heaven, sometimes you just can't change it. There are facts of life we cannot change no matter how much we may want to. Are you prepared for the aspects of life you cannot change? When all is said and done, none of us can stand without God. But to have God, you got to come to God. Are you willing today to come to Him in faith so that He can give you what no one else can? A home in heaven, forgiveness of sins. If you are here today and you need to make that decision to be repent, be baptized for forgiveness of your sins and give the Holy Spirit or just to return to him, we encourage you to do this. We stand and sing a professional song.